Welcome, everyone. If you take your, be so kind as to take your seats. We welcome you all to Liberty Church, Newtown Square, and uh, we're glad you're with us this morning. <laughs> uh, a couple announcements. We do have a congregational meeting next week. Uh, everyone is, is welcome to come and attend if we vote on anything, which we're frankly not planning to. Uh, only members would be allowed to vote. But, uh, and wanted to make sure that you realize whether you're attending, if you're attending virtually at home, that there, as was said in, in an email this week, communion cups can be mailed to you so that, that you can participate le somewhat less virtually <laughs> when you're, uh, if, that, that, if that's an issue. So uh, just request those from the office. And just wanted to, to make clear that you understood why we're wearing masks. It, it's not paranoia. It is not because we're fearful. It is because we have concern for one another in the body of Christ. And we don't want to, to needlessly spread disease or, or get one another ill. And the thing is, frankly, yes, the Lord is able to protect us. The Lord is able to, to heal us. But if Jesus did not put the Lord to the test when Satan tempted him, should we? You know, we, we don't need to put him to, to test just for the sake of saying, oh, he healed me or he kept me from getting ill. When there are precautions that we are able to take and if we love him with our mind and all of our being, that we can take to, to help one another and just to make sure that that's not a, a, a risk. So that's why we're, we're wearing masks and, and distancing. Um, and one th final thing is our, our person presenting the message this morning is John Caulfield. And we, uh, we look forward to that. We invited him to because we see him as one of the, of the young men who was, is a, a, I mean, we've heard him teach in, on, on the men's meeting on, on Saturdays and have, and have enjoyed his teaching. And we just wanted to give him the opportunity to, to teach and, and preach publicly. And we look forward to that. So if you join me in prayer. Father God, we, we do thank you for the privilege that we have to, to come together and, and meet, yes, with one another as the body of Christ, but, but most of all with you, Lord, with the, the living God, the, the creator and sustainer of, of all things. And Father, we, we just thank you and, and praise you for that privilege and, and that we can come to you in your, in your presence in if we are united in Christ, that we can come to you as your children, you know, calling out Abba, Father, Daddy, essentially, Lord, just and coming, rushing into your presence with the requests that we have. And Father, we just, we thank you and praise you for that and, and for the privilege that, that is, especially for, for sinners and rebels like ourselves who are so far from you. And, and are continually turning away from you. And yet you and your mercy continuously draw us back to yourself. And Father, we just thank you and, and praise you for that and, and pray that, that this would be a time of, of a, yes, a family gathering with one another, but a, most of all, a family gathering with you. And, and Father, we just pray that, that you would exalt yourself and, and glorify yourself through the, the words that we speak, Lord, through the, the love that we share for one another, Lord, just for, for everything that you would have us to say and to do and to think and to feel about you and about one another. And Lord, we just pray that, we would, that you would use this time that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, we do 
Lord, we, we look at our nation and, and we see a, a time of, of racial unrest and we, we just pray that, that, that you would give grace to, to work in, in both respect and, and understanding as in racial relationships and, and communication, Father. And Lord, that, that, the, that you would really, that the love and peace of Christ would prevail in, in those relationships. Father, we just pray that, Lord, for, for wisdom, for the leaders of, of our nation and of the world, Lord, in this time of dealing with the, the COVID pandemic. And, and Father, we just, we seek your wisdom and we pray that our leaders would also turn to you and look to you for wisdom and, and then put it into practice for Christ's sake. Father, we, we desire to, to glorify you in these things. We, we pray that you would with, be with those who have, have lost family and friends. We pray that you, would, that you would give wisdom and strength to those who are on the front lines of, of dealing with it, the situation and, and with trying to, to minister to the people who are ill. Father, we just thank you for your for grace and Lord, we just pray for those who are, are dealing with different illnesses, at, at, especially at this time when there's all these complicating factors or potential complicating factors. And Father, we just pray that you would continue to, to work graciously in, in hearts and minds, Lord, and, and to use these difficult times to, to draw people closer to yourself and, and really to, to come to a saving relationship with Christ. Father, we do pray for our, our brothers and sisters throughout the world where they do not have the advantages or the, or the abundance of, that, that we have here. And just pray that you would continue to, to strengthen them and lead them. Even many are, are still undergoing persecution on top of the, the uncertainties of the, the pandemic. And Father, we just pray for, for those who are ministering overseas, especially the Bowers where they're trying to reach out in new areas at the same time that they're trying to evaluate what they should be doing in, in existing ministries. And, and in, in a time when in Mali there is much political unrest. And Father, we just pray for, for them and, and the Yataras, Noah and Fadi, dealing with many health issues of their own. Uh, and yet in, in places of, of great responsibility and, and not only responsibility, but real impact in the, in the nation itself. And just pray that you would continue to, to use them and, and strengthen them in that. Father, to pray for the, the specs as well as they continue to, to minister in Europe and, and yet have been on a, a, a vacation right now with, with family and Lord just pray for them and, and well as well. Father we do um, pray for John as he as he opens up the word to us Lord that that you would fill him with your spirit, give him grace to, to give to share the words that you have given to him and and the the heart of your message that, that you've given to him from, it, from your word, Lord. And just pray that you would indeed be pleased to, to use that and to open up our hearts and minds to, to receive what you have for each of us and give us the grace to put it into practice. Father, we do pray that, that indeed you would be glorified and in all that we say and do. And, and Father, that that you would use this time to, to strengthen us, that we might be able to better go out and into the world and, and serve the people who are around us, Lord, and to see, Lord, to let them see the love of Christ in us. And just pray that you would use that to, to draw them as well to yourself. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Church, can everyone hear me okay? Well, if you'll open up your Bibles with me um, to 1 Timothy 
chapter 1. We're going to be picking up in verses 12 and going all the way through verses 20 here today. That's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. And if you don't have a Bible with you, you can find the text in your pew Bible on page 991. And if you weren't here with us last week, um, Pastor Paul, who just uh, introduced me, introduced us to the letter of 1 Timothy, which was written to the apostle, or was written by the apostle Paul to his young co-worker Timothy. And after a brief introduction, Paul very quickly gets down to brass tacks by expressing some of the serious concerns he had about the false teachers who had permeated the church at Ephesus. They were promoting meaningless speculation and false doctrine, which were muddying people's understanding of salvation and and the tangible effects of that salvation in their lives. And in today's passage, we're going to be seeing Paul provide Timothy and, and by extension us, a quick recap of exactly who are the recipients and exactly what are the tangible results of uh, a salvation and God's intervening grace. So read with me in today's text, starting in verse 12. He says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 18, he continues, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let's pray. Father, um, my prayer is is simple. If you are to increase in our sight, in our affections, I and we must decrease in our own. And I pray that would be the case. You tell us that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. So let me not malign that word, but preach it faithfully now for for your glory and, and not my own. In Christ's name, amen. All right, well, I recently read the review of a book called The Big Ego Trip. And the book's author, Glenn Harrison, seeks to describe the rise of the self-esteem movement and how it gained academic credibility across disciplines as diverse as sociology and biology and social policy. But most notably, he seeks to uh, describe how the main driving uh, force in the rise of self-esteem as a concept was the rise of psychology as a scientific discipline. You see, during the 1960s, psychology was just finding its feet and was trying to establish itself as a credible medical discipline, as a treatment. And so Harrison describes how self-esteem seemed at the time like its holy grail, its golden ticket. It seemed definable, and now it was measurable with the Rosenberg scale, and so the results could be compared and analyzed scientifically. This was just what psychology was looking for, and over time, psychologists began to unearth more and more information that seemed to show that low self-esteem was not only something that needed to be monitored, but something that needed to be improved in order to ensure the well-being of individuals. 
But these were heady times, and, and self-esteem became more than just a subplot within psychology. It became a worldview. And Harrison notes, he says, nothing could stop it now. As we arrived in the 1980s, self-esteem continued to work in pop culture, in our schools, in our colleges, our courts, our mental health services, and it leads to the very society that we find ourselves in today, one that is increasingly, increasingly obsessed with viewing ourselves as the victim instead of the perpetrator of our plight. But this is a sermon and not a lecture. And, and so I want to bring us back to the text so we can look at what Paul thinks might be at the root of, of the human dilemma. In the opening verses of the passage, we see Paul begins by implicating himself in no small list of crimes as he thanks God for appointing him to ministry despite his track record of blaspheming, of persecuting, of opposing the very work, name, and and people of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I don't want to assume that everyone here knows Paul's bio, so let me give you a little background. There's a lot that you can say about Paul, but to begin with, his name was not always Paul, right? It used to be Saul. And uh, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, and so I'm sure his mother, just wanting to pick out a godly little name for the fellow, um, picked out the one that was the most well-known Benjamite who had ever lived, right? The first king of Israel, Saul. And so this young guy, this young Saul, went on to become a great rabbi. Uh, He was well-trained in the ways of Judaism. He knew the Old Testament like the back of his hands, and he would become the most devout, anti-Christian leader within the Jewish community. He hated Christians. He went after them both tooth and nail, and he was actually on his way to capture and kill Christians in Damascus when the Lord stopped him in his tracks, converted him, and made him a preacher of the former gospel that he formerly hated. And just to make sure there was no confusion about what was going on here, he took the S off the front of his name and he replaced it with a P. He was a new man. He wanted a new name. And so Paul, he became. And from there, he went on what has to be considered one of the greatest missionary trips in the history of the church. So that is who is writing this letter to Timothy. And right off the bat, we're, 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 we're seeing him list all of his former crimes. And we gain a, we gain a very valuable insight in just that that little nugget there, one that's not the point of my message, but but worthy of our reflection nonetheless, and it's this, that ministry, that work on behalf of God is one of the very few vocations on this earth where we're checking the yes box next to have you ever been convicted of a crime actually plays to your advantage in not only getting the job, but being effective in the role. It helps right? And we're going to see why. But Paul doesn't stop there. This isn't a one-time slip-up where Paul regrettably shows us a little too much leg, a little too much of who he used to be. This has been a theme throughout all of his letters and eyewitness accounts, which he makes no attempt to, to, to suppress. In 1 Corinthians, uh, he tells us that he persecuted the church of God and is not worthy to be an apostle. Acts 22, while addressing the crowd, he tells everyone, I used to tie up men and women and throw them in jail for following Jesus. Acts 26, he continues before Agrippa. He says that he not only tracked down and locked up Christians, but when given the chance to vote on whether they should live or whether they should die, he could not be more happy to send them to the gallows. So we see here that Paul is not only unafraid to dwell on his weaknesses, but he actually seems to boast in them. And I don't... I don't think these are, these are pious exaggerations that we're seeing here. I mean, I know, guys, I know, I know, I know there is a tendency, even within my own heart, but broader Christian circles, to, to, to tell war stories about who we used to be and what we used to do as a way of spiritual posturing and nothing more. It's false humility, trying to bring glory to yourself. But, but Paul seems sincere When he says in verse 15, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am 
the foremost, the foremost, sure, he, he could be wrong. Don't get, he could be wrong. There could have been someone in a neighboring village who had committed more vile demonstrations of sin than Paul had done. But in his mind, when he says that he's foremost, he is not lying. He believes that, church. And the question that I want to pose for our reflection here today is, do you? Do you believe that? Are you foremost? Not, not Paul. Do you believe that you are the chief of sinners? Because here's, here's the deal. I think there are many poor and starving souls in our midst who have unknowingly bought into a worldly wisdom which encourages believers to feel better about themselves by boasting in their strengths instead of their weaknesses. Whose hearts don't erupt into praise at these verses because we've convinced ourselves that our stories do not align with Paul's and who would say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, but listen, my, my story's not that dramatic and who need to be reminded that there is no greater drama than the story of redemption in which God reconciles himself to an adulterous people. There's nothing ordinary or mundane about it. But oh, you say, well, oh, that makes sense for Paul. He killed people, but I've never had a parking ticket. Or, or I, I was saved at a very young age, you see. I can't, I can't even remember a time where Jesus didn't love me so. Or, or you'd admit that, yeah, yeah, I got a pass, and I'm glad that it stays between me and God. But at the end of the day, I'm no Charlie Manson. I, I work hard. I take care of my family. I've never cheated on my wife. Well, maybe not ever, but you punch your time clock at St. So-and-so's every Easter and Christmas. You're good. You're good. On and on and on it goes until one day we find ourselves, you find yourself watching a terrible story on the evening news. Terrible story. And your first reaction is, what monsters? What monsters? How could a person do something like that? Well, perhaps it's as simple as the perpetrator had low self-esteem. That could have been a factor. Or perhaps even better, it's because we have forgotten. We've forgotten, right? We've forgotten that before Christ, we too were dead men walking. We have forgotten that before Christ, we are described as a people whose throats were an open grave. We've forgotten that before Christ pulled us from our coffin, we too were slowly rotting away. And, and if you were not the foremost at that point, then I'm sorry to break it to you, but it may have only been a matter of time. Is your heart there, church? Are you there? I've heard it said that, yeah, most of us do not grow up to be Ivan the Terrible or Adolf Hitler. But guess what? It's not through lack of talent. It's not. Make no mistake about it. There was more Saul in you than Paul before Jesus knocked you off your donkey. And that's what Paul's trying to show us here. That Paul's getting at in verse 15 when he calls himself the foremost of sinners is that my heart, do you hear that, church? My, my heart, not my actions, my heart is fundamentally no different in its base nature and capabilities than the absolute worst of sinners. I am foremost. Are you there too? Are you there? Sure, my, my flesh may not have matured as quickly on the outside as some others have, but, but guess what? Here's the kicker. That had less to do with your self-control and more to do with the restraining grace of God which got to you first. He plucked me from my hell-bound race. He robed me with a righteousness that is not own, and he plants in us a spirit by which we now cry, Abba, Father, but for the grace of God I am what I am. Do you see this, church? Because this, this should send you sore, and it's key. Paul is saying that man certainly has an issue with the way that he views himself, but his problem is not that he thinks too little. His problem is that he thinks too much. 
our esteem for Christ, our love for Christ, our admiration for Christ will only go as high as our esteem of ourselves goes low. This is far from the infantile wisdom of this world, and we see Paul here fleshing out the paradoxical wisdom of God. You can call it, you can't get the good news without the bad news. Call it getting low in order to abound. Call it losing your life that you might save it. Call it what? Whatever you will, but Lord, just don't call me late to your table, because left to my own devices, I will fare no better than Legion and his whole host of demons before your throne. Our sin, church, it may not have brought us to the county jail, but it better bring us to our knees. That's my first point. We think too highly of ourselves. And this, this is a side effect. It's a side effect of, of man's allergy towards viewing himself in light of God's moral perfection, of his holy standard. We don't like doing that, right? I want to compare myself with Megan's list, right? Martin Lloyd-Jones said it well. He said, man will never make himself feel that he is a sinner because there is a mechanism in him as the result of the fall that will always be defending him against every accusation. He goes on, he says, we're, we're all on very good terms with ourselves and we are excellent at putting up a case for ourselves. Does that ring true? So we struggle with seeing ourselves objectively, and when we do, our tendency is quick to excuse or justify or defend. And, and this mechanism, it plagues both believers and unbelievers alike, though certainly in varying degrees. But there is a flip side to that coin of thinking too highly of ourselves, and, and that is also that we can think too lowly of ourselves. That's my second point. Now, this is a problem that is typically unique to those who have trusted in Christ. So you might call it the ultimate luxury problem. And, and this quandary is, is typically experienced by that believer. You know who you are out there, right? And I'm, I'm in this boat too, who already has their depravity inspection down pat, right? In fact, when you examine yourself, your trouble isn't that you can't look sin square in the eye. That comes naturally to you. Your problem is you just can't stop staring. You're zoned in. Your radar is locked. Christ, if he is anywhere, is way off on the peripheral. But all that you can see is that which is unclean, unworthy in your Father's affections. And we need to go back to the text to see how does Paul walk this tightrope? Because he shows us how. How does, he, how does he stay between thinking too highly of himself and thinking too lowly of himself? Well, look with me at verse 13. We see that after calling himself out, Paul is quick to follow with these words. He says, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Now, as a side note, that, that ignorantly right there, that's a willful ignorance. Big difference, right? He, he chose to suppress the truth and unrighteousness, as Romans tells us, and therefore he is without excuse. He is culpable for each and every single one of his ignorant actions as we are too. There's no get out of jail free card because we didn't want to know. But moving on, we see the same thing in verse 15 after labeling himself the foremost of sinners. He follows with this, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Do you see that pattern, church? Do you see it? He is ruthlessly honest with himself about the severity of his former transgressions. He's not pulling any punches. And yet in the wake of these examinations, he winds up ecstatic in a state of bewilderment. Why? Why does he do that? Because with every sin cited, he sees, he recalls, he remembers another, another mercy given. And that church is what separates the world in their melancholy from the church in their rejoicing. 
right? That's the difference. And, it, what, and look, what, look what he's doing. What, he goes on, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You can imagine him shouting that. What is that sentence doing in there, though? Why is he saying that? That doesn't move the narrative along at all. Well, it's an outburst, you see. See, see Paul, Paul cannot think about what a terrible sinner he has been without immediately becoming filled with this glorious joy. This is a far cry from the self-esteem approach. In fact, it's the polar opposite. In his instant classic, Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortland has strong words of encouragement for those who would find themselves in this slump, right? Who, who have believed, but who somehow have, have gotten off track and, un, and think that they have outspent God's mercy. He says this, perhaps you have difficulty receiving the rich mercy of God in Christ, not because of what others have done to you, but because of what you have done to torpedo your own life, maybe through one big stupid decision or 10,000 little ones. Perhaps you have squandered his mercy and you know it. To you I say, do you know what Jesus does to those who squander his mercy? Do you know? He pours out more mercy. God is rich in mercy. That's the whole point of Paul's message here, that regardless of what we bring to the table, the Bible says that God is not tight-fisted with mercy, but open-handed. He's not frugal, but lavish. Not poor, but rich. His mercy is not calculating and cautious as if we were the ones administering it. No, this, this means that the feeling of inadequacy that self-esteemers so desperately seek to avoid is the very thing that makes him hug the hardest, church. That's get real with yourself. It means that on the day when we stand before him, church, we will weep with relief. We will be shocked at how impoverished a view we had of his mercy, rich heart toward us. Paul says it in verse 14, the Lord's grace overflows in Christ. And if this was his heart toward us while we were lost, will his heart be anything less toward us now that we're found? Take heart, weary saint. If you've believed that Jesus hung on that cross in your place, the gavel has banged, the law has been satisfied, you have been cleared on all charges, and though you may not see anything in you worthy of admiration, when the Father now looks upon you, he gushes with the same affection that he holds towards his own beloved Son. That is the state in which we now walk as believers. Now, which one is it? You may be wondering to yourself, which one is it? First, you tell us our self-esteem is too high, and then you say that it is too low. Make up your mind, will you? How can both of those things be true at the same time? And I'm glad that you asked, because it is here that that we get into one of the most glorious paradoxes of the Christian faith. It is here that we find a man who is able to reconcile two seemingly contradictory claims. Because it is here that we are introduced to a man who knew no sin but became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It is here that we find him who did not count equality with God something to be grasped but emptied himself by being born in the likeness of man and ultimately humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. It is here, it is here, it is here that we find the God-man Jesus Christ here this church 
who took on our low self-esteem so that those who would cling to him by faith and faith alone, check your works at the door, would inherit his perfectly high esteem in his Father's eyes. What a glorious exchange. Do you see it, church? It's in him. It's in him. It's in him that we inherit our worthiness because the truth is, church, we will all one day stand before a righteous, holy, unblemished God of holiness. And he cannot tolerate an ounce of sin in his perfect presence. And if anyone will be accepted before him, it will be because they have repented and believed and therefore have imputed to them an alien righteousness, as it's been called, a foreign righteousness, a perfect credit history that is not their own but Christ. This is the untainted gospel. And I pray, I pray that it would land on us as the sweetest news we could ever hear so that we could leave this room like a pack of roaring lions, as Piper says, a pack of ungodly in themselves, but made righteous in Christ and therefore lion-hearted believers. Because if you wait around, church, if you wait around, to muster up enough sanctification to become bold, you will never be bold. You will never have an outburst like the one we see Paul have here over the marvelous mercy of God that saved a wretch like me. In fact, if you worry if you worry that your neighbor is going to say back to you when you celebrate this justification of God in Christ, well, you don't look that much better than anyone else. You know what you're going to say? I know. And isn't that great? Let me tell you about grace. Let me tell you about mercy. Let me tell you about justification of the ungodly. Now, there better be something that's different about you than the world. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, here is your application, church. Don't let your sin, don't let your background, your former life make you shy. Use it. Use your sin. Because if you can't, you will never, ever testify to the saving work of Jesus, ever. Oh, that we would never look within ourselves for our effectiveness. Because there's not a shred, not a thread, not a fiber that you will find. But if you will look upon yourself and sing with the hymn writer, where nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim, I wash these garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb then by God's grace, you too might find yourself in a white, hot rejoicing that we see here with Paul as he ponders the merciful God who, 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 who turns shipwrecked sinners into monuments of his transforming grace. <sighs> Do you marvel at your conversion? Do you marvel at it? I wish I could stop there. I wish I could, but my job is to preach the text. And in closing, look at me, look with me at um, verses 18 through 20 together. Paul leaves Timothy and us with some pretty simple instructions here. He says, in essence, fight the good faith, maintain a good conscience. And, and don't forget my charge about those false teachers. Deal with them. And he mentions two of those false teachers by name, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who Paul says he handed over to Satan. Whew. What does that mean? It's pretty, pretty intense language, don't you think? Well, well, here's what it means. To deliver one over to Satan is to put a professing yet unrepentant 
unrepentant believer out of your fellowship, to excommunicate him from the body of believers, from the church. And there's a lot of situational nuance there that we should be leaning on our elders uh, for guidance in. But you see, at the end of the day, Satan is the ruler of this world. And he is turning, and in turning a believer over to Satan, you are simply thrusting him back into the world on his own. Act like the world, go back to the world. You don't see no reason to repent. And the key part here is it's apart from the care and support of Christian fellowship. This, listen, this is not a rash explosion on behalf of the church. We're not frustrated. Rather, it is a tear-filled, settled opposition which gently casts a person away in hopes that by feeling the true hopelessness and weight of their sin apart from the comforts of Christian community, apart from the comforts of the church, that they will repent of their sin and come back to the Father. What we see here is Paul referring to the practice of church discipline. And it's always motivated by love. We've not reached the end of our road. It's motivated by love for the professing believer as well as the purity of the church. And please, I warn you, do not misinterpret what I am saying here. I'm not saying that the church does not allow misbehaviors in her midst. In fact, if that were the case, there would be no church, right? It's famously been said that, that the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. But, but here's what I am saying, that Jesus Christ, he is deadly serious about the purity of his gospel. And if you come into this hospital, like Hymenaeus and Alexander and you begin touting any other cure, faith plus works, <laughs> reliance upon the law, Paul says, get them out. Let them be accursed so that they may learn not to blaspheme. There's a process to that. We see it outlined in Matthew 18. It's a long one filled with much pleading. But listen, God says throughout Scripture, make sure you tell them on the way out that if they should turn back to the truth, I will be waiting for them. Tears streaming, calf slaughtered, robe ready with open arms, ready to receive them. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, you are a God who is rich in mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Let us never attempt to insert ourselves into an equation which contributes nothing to our works but only to Christ's work. In Jesus' name, amen. Is there anything more appropriate after hearing teaching on God's word, particularly in the way that John has just brought it to us, where we would not come to the Lord's table and not see it as a celebration? You know, John mentioned, you know, call me what you will, but don't call me late for dinner. God, do not call me late for your table because the final table is a feast that if you are in Christ, if you read that passage in 1 Timothy and you say, that is me, that, that is my story. I am, I'm the worst of sinners, but I received mercy. If you can say that, then you are welcome at this table in this church, but you will also be welcome in heaven, with our host, Jesus Christ, in person. 
I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's, it's supposed to be pretty good. The Bible's pretty high on it. The Lord's table or communion is, it's an example that Christ set for us. Jesus himself was the originator of this. And the purpose of it was to remind us, to remind us of exactly what we heard this morning. That even though we are sinners, while we were dead in our sin, Christ died for us. It's, it's a reminder that Christ's body was broken. And that just like in the, the first Passover in Egypt, the lamb was slain. It's not just the blood, it's the lamb, it's the sustenance. The lamb itself was what gave them the, the energy and the endurance to go on this trip that they were about to go on. And the blood, the blood was there to cover, to cover the actual lives of the firstborn. Their actual lives, it did not spare the lives of those in Egypt, the Egyptians because they did not sprinkle the blood on the doorposts of their homes nor of their souls. But communion is also a public act of worship out of response for what we just heard. It, it is a joyful celebration in which we remind ourselves of what he has done. There's nothing magical in this. These little elements, this, this edible styrofoam <laughs> thingy, in the grape juice, there's nothing magical about them. The Bible merely talks about bread and it talks about the fruit of the vine. And that's why we use these elements. But these elements remind us of Christ himself. They remind us of his body that he allowed willingly. He was God in the flesh and he willingly set aside all power and glory that he had to allow his body to be whipped, beaten, and broken and nailed to a cross. And this grape juice reminds us of the blood that was shed, the blood that was so necessary to purchase us, to pay for our sins. We see this all through the Old Testament. Whenever there was agreement between God and his people, and then Jesus Christ, when he was sitting at the table, when he reclined at table, remember that passage? When he reclined at table with his disciples, he was saying that I am the fulfillment of this. The, the blood that is necessary to seal this agreement between you and God, that's my blood. And that is why we do this. And then lastly, we share, we participate in Christ's death and resurrection. How's that possible? The thoughts that go through my head, the way that I speak to my kids, the way that I treat my wife, sometimes the thoughts I have for my coworkers or the other people who cut me off in traffic, how at all can I take this with a right conscience? I think John's made that very clear through the passage in 1 Timothy because I received mercy. We take these things to remind ourselves that we are unworthy before God, but because of Jesus Christ, we are now worthy. Yeah. How is that possible? Mm -hmm. But thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Yeah. I'd like you to begin crinkling your wrappers and opening these. Paul speaks about this very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he basically, it's in a, a different context where there, people were taking the, the Lord's Supper inappropriately. But he, he gives us the example there when he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. This is in the upper room, if you remember. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, probably resembling what would happen to him. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this 
and remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This, the blood that Jesus was going to spill, was going to seal the deal for us and for his disciples. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this or drink this. Or remember this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink in glory and worship. Why don't we stand together? Sing a few songs together as we leave, just rejoicing in the good news of the gospel, in the death and in the resurrection. Let's raise our voices to him who is worthy of all praise.
God, you are good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me.
new life in you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, show us what's possible when we live a life of deep humility, yet a full understanding about our position and who we are in you. Father, would you help us see what is possible when we hold that tension as Paul did. The world is turned upside down, God. We believe you in that as we go from here, God. There's application for us to do. There's work for us to do. Holy Spirit, we welcome you as we leave this place throughout our week. Would you speak to us on this? This is so dear to your heart for us to get this. To experience daily the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name because you make all things possible. But without you, we can do nothing. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen, church. All God's people said amen. Go. Bless you. Have great weeks. We're excited to be back here next week together.